So we got a really good question today, and that's always kind of an exciting moment for us because we're not at your tournaments, so we don't know what it is that you're struggling with. And when a request comes in, that feels to us like an opportunity to be helpful. And the question that came in today was, every 2 and R needs a good, emphatic way of urging the judge, reminding the judge not to allow new arguments in 2AR, but how do you do that without crossing the line of being whiny? And I think what I would recommend, it really breaks down whether your judge is a flow judge or a judge who's not flowing, and in many cases a lay judge. And with a flow judge, you can pretty much take it for granted that they are flowing so that they can keep track of the chain of extension and they can spot dropped arguments. So the way I have seen really successful debaters over the years phrase it for flow judges is really they just ask them to draw a line backwards. They just say, for any argument that you hear in the 2AR that is important enough and good enough that you think it's going to be a turning point in your decision, do us a favor, take one extra second and draw the line backward from that argument to where it originated in the 1AR. And if you can't find the spot, then disallow it. And it could be that you need to go a little bit further with some judges who are really proud of how tabula rasa they are, and you got to get the whole explanation out there that new arguments in the 2AR are illegitimate because I don't get a chance to answer them, and then you're not making a comparison about the better debating. But very often, a lot of judges will pretty much assume that that is a waste of verbiage. So I would only add on that impact if you know that you've got someone, probably an alum judge, who is the permissive try anything type. Because I have known a few judges over the years who said just calling an argument new and not impacting that is not going far enough. Okay, what do you do if it's a lay judge? If it's a lay judge, then the, the danger that you're going to make a negative impression is a lot higher. The danger that you are going to sound preemptively like you have a bad attitude and you don't have confidence in your arguments and you have to warn the judge that your opponents are going to try to bend the rules or pull something shady, that can make a negative impression. So the way I think that you lead that off is you say something along the lines, your own phrasing, but you say something along the lines of, now I know that our opponents want to win this debate just as badly as we do. And what they're going to be tempted to do in the speech that follows is they're going to be tempted to offer you some explanation and some arguments that have never appeared before in the debate. But here is what I would like you to think about. I want you to keep in mind that debate is not a contest in which side is closer to being right. Instead, it's a contest in which side did the better debating. And the object of the game is to be able to carry your argument in the face of refutation from the other side, which is why this event is different from simply persuasive speaking. So, if they make an argument for the first time in the last rebuttal and we never had a chance to answer it, they can be as correct as they want, but it's not good debating. You might think of it as the way every four years at the Olympics, they, for the marathon, they don't just let the elite runners send in their times and give the medals out that way. They actually have to show up. They actually have to run the race. They actually have to put themselves at risk and let their rivals cut in and put on pushes and so forth, that's how you prove that you're the best racer. And so if our opponents in the next speech make some really, really appealing arguments that seem to resolve it for you, but if you can't remember where those arguments appeared earlier in the first affirmative rebuttal, then please remind yourself that it's not about who's closer to being right, it's about who did the better debating. And I'm also going to ask, as soon as this speech is over, that you take just a couple of extra seconds and you remind yourself of what the first affirmative rebuttal had to say on these issues that I focused the debate upon so that it will be very clear to you whether the second affirmative rebuttal's arguments appeared early in the debate, early enough that I had notice of them and the opportunity to answer them. Now, that was fairly long-winded, and I think that was probably 15, 20 seconds, and that might be more than you want to invest. But the elements of it there are, I think you begin by saying, if they make new arguments in the next rebuttal, it'll just be because they're excited and they want to win. So you take off the table the issue that you might be calling your opponents a little bit sub-ethical, a little bit shady, a little not to be trusted and that you're doing it preemptively even before any such infraction has happened, then I think if you put it right in front of the judge that the nature of the contest is not truth, the nature of the contest is clash, and if clash hasn't happened, then what happens is not relevant to the outcome. You might find a better way to phrase it. You might find another analogy that comes out of sports or comes out of another kind of competition that captures that better, that whatever you can do, whatever great feats you can pull off and display your talent and impress people, if you don't do it in a situation where an opponent has a chance 
chance to put pressure on you and an opponent has a chance to test you, then the object of this particular sport has been thwarted. It's been sabotaged. And what you did, it may be an athletic accomplishment, it may be a competitive accomplishment, but it is not the way you win this particular sport. So those are some possibilities, I think. And really, I think that's the kind of explanation that you would want to play test in practice rounds a number of times until you could get the wording whittled down to where it feels really good in your mouth, to where you've got it in your own phrasing and you're very familiar with it, and it's not going to take on a life of its own and become a way of rambling. Because really, I think, if I were you, and if you have the discipline to do it without eating up a lot of your time, it's the kind of explanation you would introduce near the beginning of the speech and then have a shortened version of it at the end of the speech. Because social science research makes it very clear, if you want something to be memorable, put it at the beginning of your message, put it at the end of the message, and really maximize your chances with a developed version at the beginning and just a reminder at the end. So those are some tips, and best of luck to you taking those pesky two ARs and removing from them the option of introducing new arguments at the end of the debate, because as a former 2 and r myself, I know that's the kind of thing that drives you crazy.